Greetings and welcome to this lecture on computer security. My name's Richard Harvey and uh, I am one of the professors here uh, at Gresham College. And this is the last lecture of my uh, season, so um, I hope we're going to have lots of sort of uh, lively comment and thought afterwards, and we certainly should do, because this is an issue of the moment. That said, uh, computer security is a highly technical area, and Gresham College has done a fantastic job at sort of talking about it over the years, and I've just picked out a few sort of uh, distinguished colleagues who've given this something of a running over. Uh, uh, probably the most recent is uh, Martin Thomas, who was my predecessor. Uh, Martin was a specialist in computer security and uh, talked about this and, and privacy in a lot. I also recommend uh, the recent lecture by Tara Wheeler, who was a visiting professor here this year, and she talked about um, ransomware and, um, oh, what was it, uh, WannaCry. She was talking about WannaCry. Uh, which was the famous uh, bit of ransomware that um, caused problems to the National Health Service. But there were also some lectures in the uh, law series talking about um, the sort of meaning of, of this area in terms of society, uh, all of which are sort of fascinating topics. So now I've got this difficult job of having to recap you know, hours and hours and hours of that material. Um, so I'm going to do a sort of a grotesquely oversimplified uh, job which I'm going to do here. And the sort of long and the short of it is that um, software is very complicated. Developers make mistakes. And they're not functional mistakes in the sense that they stop software working. They are exploitable um, errors. And baddies uh, exploit those mistakes. And goodies, trying to stop those baddies, also exploit those mistakes. And we'll talk a little bit about that as... Uh, as we go through this lecture. And the consequence of this is it's all getting a bit out of hand and um, people are actually dying. Um, deaths are being caused because some of the systems that are being attacked are in life, in you know, mission critical uh, bits of the internet. And the root cause of all of this really is that the internet was designed to work without encryption. And this was something I covered in the previous lecture on networking. And uh, uh, you'll have to go back to that lecture and look at why that, why that was. Um, but it, now, it's not that the internet doesn't have security in it. You know, there's quite a large level of, um, many levels of internet security. It's just, it's a bit of an afterthought. And you can see that in some of the exploits that people are um, using in um, the current uh, hacks and troublemaking on the internet. In terms of uh, a bit of terminology, I should quickly reveal that the baddies on the internet are usually known as black hat hatters, uh, black hat hackers, uh, black hats because in old cowboy films, the baddies always wore black hats, apparently. And then people trying to be goodies, they're often the white hats. And, um, well, the fact that they use internet uses unencrypted packets. Well, I've used a top hat because that's old hat, if you like. So these are the hats. These are the hats of computer security. Now, there's more than one lecture that can be written about your um, private life. And um, this is um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who's famous for this, this quote, which I like very much. Um, what he doesn't say is that everyone has a right to a private life, but perhaps he, he could have done and should have done. Now, the right to a private life is a sort of fiercely contested issue, actually, and I think it's fair to say that it's not quite resolved how much of a right you have to a private life. There are various laws in various territories which imply that you probably should have a right to a private life. Um, I think most government's position would be um, you have a right to a private life except when we say so and we're not going to be very precise about what we mean by that because if we are precise it will be exploited by someone in a way that we don't like. Now that's a, that's a big problem, that sort of shifting sounds of, of definitions um, and I'm just going to park it there I'll sort of come back to it at the end of this talk probably. Um, it's a big 
big unanswered question mark, and it probably deserves a whole series of legal lectures talking about what the private life, what your private life is. There have been several um, inquiries into this or, or investigations into privacy. Um, both the Royal Academy of Engineering did one and the Royal Society did an investigation into it. And if you're fascinated in this topic, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of pages you can read. I think I can summarise what they said quite quickly, which was um, privacy is quite a good idea and we think software ought to help you protect it. But that's probably... I'm sort of paraphrasing a bit, but that's probably about as far as they got. You know, it is a complex topic. In terms of your mental model, ladies and gentlemen, it might be helpful to think about what if every single bit of communication took place on a postcard? Right? And let's imagine the whole of society, a whole of sort of Victorian society and all of the Industrial Revolution, the only uh, communication was a postcard because that's the best analogy we've got to a packet. So... You can see the problems. Uh, I don't know if you remember the scene in... Um, who's the character? There's a character in Under Milk Wood, Postman, who um, reads everyone's mail and then tells everyone about it. It would be like that. Um, the, um, oh, was it Mr Pugh, the Postman? I wish I remembered. Anyway, whatever. It, it, you, you, you see the problem, that um, when the system is fundamentally open, you have to go to quite extraordinary lengths to keep things private that you would wish to keep private. In short, the sort of four parameters of internet communication, which come up time and time again, they're sort of old, um, old tropes almost of, of the theme, are, are one, what is private? What do we mean by privacy? Two, what is the reward for hacking this system, this crypto cryptographic or other protection system, versus what is the effort for hacking into that system? And then the last one is, which never gets mentioned, but I think should, is what is the connectivity of that system? And that connectivity one is rather interesting. I mean, there's a sort of modern assumption, which is that everybody is connected all of the time, and they must be. Um, that, that needn't be the case, you know. And, you know, a number of organisations that take security seriously will back up onto what is called air-gapped systems, are they? unplug the cable having done the backup so that they are just not connected to the internet. Hacking is really an internet phenomenon. You don't get that much hacking uh, without lots of connectivity. So uh, just leave that out there. You don't actually have to connect to the internet all the time and when you do, you are clearly more at risk than when you're not um, there. I'll give you one little sort of anecdote that illustrates that. Um, I was at a very, very, very large uh, internet company, a company which I better not mention, but they are very significant in uh, internet communication, if not the most significant internet communication. And when the iPhone first came out, their chief executive wanted to connect uh, their iPhone to the, to the internal network of this company. And the first iPhones weren't very secure, so the network administrator said no. And there was a bit of a tussle, and you can imagine how it worked out, which was the chief executive said, well, I jolly well am connecting, and some secret credentials were produced, and a secret sort of algorithm, secret set of steps was allowed just so the chief executive could connect his iPhone to the company. Uh, one week later, the sysadmin rechecked to see uh, that everything was okay, and he discovered that 10,000 people by that time had connected their iPhone. That's how connectivity spreads. You know, clearly the CEO had told his friends and they told their friends and so on and so on and so on. In terms of the sort of danger factors, if you like, or the factors that cause internet security to be such an issue, uh, I've mentioned the first one, which is the fundamental openness of internet packets, which means if you want something to be secret, you're going to have to assume that everything you do is, is seen and that's led to a whole new form of um, uh, some whole new ideas on encryption and security. The second factor is that internet laws do not have exact parallels in physical laws. And um, it's not necessarily a problem that, but it means that you're operating in a different legal environment and you're often operating in a trans-jurisdictional legal environment. So even deciding whether what you want to do is legal and compliant is a major issue and can be very... Uh, troublesome. 
and you can you can see that reflected all over the place. So, for example, um, a number of secure encryption technologies are prohibited from export to certain countries by the USA and possibly by the UK. Um, so that makes commercial operation using those almost impossible. The third one is a sort of sociological um, aspect, which is people are, well, the, the third and fourth are really sociological, sort of psychological aspects, which is people are acknowledged to be disinhibited on the internet, so they don't worry so much about doing things that are antisocial. And the fourth one is that people of similar interests find it easy to flock together. So, so whereas you're, minor, you're in a village, your interest might have been so minority that it essentially would have died out. When you're in a big community, it's possible to generate a lot of sort of shared knowledge and shared enterprise, uh, which isn't possible when you don't have good connectivity. If you're interested in those two effects, there's a very interesting book by um, Mary Aiken called The Cyber Effect, which I, I hesitate to recommend because I don't agree with everything she says, but it's, but it's still a good read. You, know, you, uh, you don't have to agree with everything in a book to say it's a good book, do you? So then, um, well, the, the solution to some of these problems, and the, it's quite an elderly solution now, is secret writing or cryptography. And um, the sort of key paper on cryptography was written by Claude Shannon. And Claude Shannon's a sort of old friend of this uh, series of lectures. And not, not intentionally, but it, I think in almost every lecture I have mentioned Claude Shannon because he seems to have invented almost everything. Uh, but if you look back at past lectures, there is a little potted history uh, of, of the man. And he wrote a classified report in 1945 when he was at Bell Systems uh, on uh, secrecy. And he developed this little diagram, which sort of explains a message being sent and a key in ciphering it. His key result was that um, uncrackable codes are all sort of isomorphic to a type of code called a one-time pad. A one-time pad is an idea where you, um, you essentially give um, your spy a book of uh, a random jumble of letters and they write their message against that jumble of letters and then they read off that and you have an identical book, your end, and it's essentially un uncrackable. And the only uncrackable things are one-time pads, but the enormous impracticality of equipping two people with books. You, can you imagine trying to encrypt uh, gigabytes of information by reading off one-time pads? Very difficult indeed. Um, the impracticality of that means that you have to share some information. And the information you share is called a key, and that's shown in this diagram. So a key is just a number, and it's a number that I know, and the person who is receiving the uh, information knows, and I use my key to jumble up the message, usually using some mathematical algorithm that's very difficult to work backwards. The receiver unjumbles it because they have the key, and suddenly with the key it becomes easy to unjumble, and then they get the message. So a really simple, simple idea. Now, beautiful thing about cryptography is it's very simple to describe and fiendishly difficult in the details. There's a wonderful, a wonderful bits of mathematics. So I'm going to step quite lightly over cryptography uh, today. Not that it's not interesting, it's, it's, it's too interesting is the, is the problem. Now just to introduce a bit of um, terminology that is commonly used in the, uh, in the field, uh, the, one of the senders and receivers of a message is always conventionally known as Alice, and the other receiver is known as Bob. Um, there's, a, there's a very complex backstory being developed about Alice and Bob. I can never remember. Sometimes they're having a divorce, and sometimes they're having a secret affair, you know, whatever. Um, they, they originally ar they arise from a paper in um, 1978 by uh, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and uh, Leonard Edelman, the inventors of the RSA, named after their... Uh, um, initials RSA, um, encryption algorithms, and they called it Bob and Alice. Um, there's usually somebody sort of lurking in the middle, uh, who's uh, Shannon calls an enemy cryptanalyst, but because they're an eavesdropper, they're often called Eve, um, either in the French Eve or uh, uh, English female name Eve, doesn't, doesn't matter which. If you're interested, Wikipedia has a whole cast of these 
um, bizarre characters. But Bob and Alice will, I think Bob, Bob and Alice came up in a previous lecture where I was talking about um, man in the middle attacks um, on in, in security. So then, bit of detail. I thought I'd just pick one of these um, protocols that's used to keep things secret. And um, rather than picking one of the sort of complex encryption algorithms, I pick something which I particularly like, which is a method for sharing the keys. Now, you can see the problem with this key. You know, if I'm communicating with you, then um, we have to have this shared secret between us. But if you're selling me stuff, I mean, I've probably never met you. So how do I, when I'm on the John Lewis website, let's say, or you know, trying to buy something, how do I tell John Lewis that what my secret key is? Well, in principle, you know, I could drive up there and sort of give them a great big long uh, piece of paper and they could say, oh, thank you, Mr. Harvey, I'll just write that down and we'll keep it secret and here's my key. I mean, that, that does happen. You know, and in very, very secure systems, that, that can happen. But there obviously has to be some way in which we exchange this top secret information between us. And if that exchange goes wrong, uh, all my transactions with that person are going to be compromised. So the, the risks are quite great. I mean, if it's my bank, you know, it, I don't want my bank account raided and drained just because uh, the preamble to our communication was insecure. So the solution to this is named after three authors, the Diffie, Hellman, Merkel key exchange. Now, a couple of things just quickly to say. Poor old Mr. Merkel often gets missed off this. Um, I don't, there's no reason for this. He was an original author. In fact, Diffie has said he should be named, so I'm going to try and name him correctly each time. However, my brain seems to somehow confuse Merkel with Markle, and I think that's just because of current affairs. I keep making Mr. Merkel a Markle, so if I do that, please excuse me. He is a Merkel, not a Markle. Sorry, basic idea here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's a tiny little bit of mathematics coming up. It might look a bit daunting at this stage. Do not freak out. It is easy peasy, easy easy, lemon squeezy stuff that we're going to go through, and even if you don't get it, doesn't matter, the whole lecture will not be ruined for you. I just want to go through this because I, I think it's particularly beautiful. Um, so here's the idea. What we're going to do is we're going to publicize two numbers, and I'm going to call those G and P. Um, and everybody can know those. And what we're going to use is a very simple little bit of maths to convert my secret number into a public number. Okay? And I've written down the, the secret, the, the simple bit of maths here. That's the only bit of maths we need. Now, it says g raised to the power key mod p equals k. So if you just ignored the mod p for the moment, what you've got to do is raise a number to a power. Now, it's not at all obvious when I say that why that should lead to any secrecy at all. So I'm just going to explain briefly why that makes it a challenge. Um, and just, you know, keep the faith because it's not that hard. And the reason it becomes a code, you know, becomes a challenge for someone to decrypt is modulo arithmetic. So in order to explain what's going on here, I'm firstly going to ignore the modulo bit and then we'll uh, get back to it. So let's choose a G, and this is usually called a base. So I'm, I'm picking a simple example here. I'm actually picking one that's on Wikipedia. So if you want to follow this up later, you can just work the numbers and get the same... Uh, same answer. So if I said, well, my g is 5, then g raised to the power 1 is just 5, right? That's just one lot of 5. g squared is 5 times 5, 25. g cubed, 5 times 5 times 5, 125. g to the 4, 625, and so on and so on. Everyone can do that, right? Yeah, good. That's, a, that's the easy bit. No problem. So, now let's do that using modulo arithmetic. And you have to declare a number over which you're going to do your modulo arithmetic. And I've picked uh, a number, 23. I should say 23 is not the number that is used in reality. It is a far, 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 far larger number than that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to compute g raised to this power. And then I'm going to work out the answer modulo 23. And what modulo means is, look, 
divide the result by 23 and see what the remainder is. Okay, so let's do that. So g raised to the power 1 is 5, right? Well, 23 goes into 5 zero times, so the remainder is just 5. And I've plotted 5 over there on my circle. g squared is 25. 25, we can divide that by 23 once, giving a remainder of 2. So g squared mod 23 is 2, and I've put 2 over here on my circle. g cubed is 10, g to the fourth is 4. These are just the remainders modulo 23. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but what seemed to be a, a very sort of obvious progression, you know, if we wrote down in a sort of a Guardian quiz at the back, or in a newspaper quiz, can you work out what's going on here? 5, 25, 125, 625, it's sort of, you know, quite junior school. We go, oh yes, it's powers of 5. As soon as we've added this modulo function, it's become this sort of splendid jumble. You know, 5, 2, 10, numbers are all over the place. Right, that's why this is difficult to decrypt. Okay, that modulo function makes it very hard to uh, work this backwards. And that's what the key exchange system uses. So this is how it works. It's a really beautiful system. So let's say Alice is going to initiate communication and uh, the good Alice um, is going to speak to the good Bob and lurking in the model, uh, in the middle here is the public, general public and amongst the general public, we have Eve, who is listening in with her bat-like ears and trying to solve this problem. So everybody knows, in this case, P, which was 23, and G, which was the base, which was 5. That's well known. Alice chooses a secret key, let's say 6. And what she does is she then computes her public key. So she raises G to the power A, and then she computes that modulo uh, 23, giving the result 8. And 8 is now a public number. Eve cannot work back easily from 8 to the uh, private key. Well, to be fair, Eve could if, if P was 23, but Eve certainly cannot if P was the number I'm going to show you in a moment. It's, too, it's, it's very hard. Bob also does the same. He says, well, I'm going to choose a secret key. Uh, here's my secret key, which is um, 15. Same idea compute my public key, which is 19, and then the beautiful bit happens, which is Alice then raises Bob's public key, 19, to the power of her private key and computes the modulo again, and she gets the number 2, and then Bob computes Alice's public key, raises it, raises it to the power of his private key, modulo again, and he also gets the number 2. Now, this number 2 is a shared secret between Alice and Bob that Eve cannot discover. Now, if this was an undergraduate lecture, I would say I'd leave it as an exercise to the reader to prove that they are identical, but there's a little, little observation down in the bottom here that they are uh, the, the same thing. Now, this is a, you know, a very sort of um, attractive idea because Alice and Bob are sharing information publicly, and that's usually called their public key, but retaining their secrets. Eve does not have enough information to easily crack that. OK, well, how might we crack it? Well, if we knew G and P, and we do, then we've really got to do what's called, an, well, a, the simplest thing is to do an exhaustive search. So what we would do in this case is we would say, well, what if we guess? So we say, well, maybe Alice's key was one. If it was one, what would happen? Oh, five to the power of one is one. No, it's not that. What if it was two? Oh, if I, uh, maybe. No. So we have to search through every single possibility. Blech. Right? That is not good. Um, I've written ad nauseum for um, good reason. And that sort of search is going to take around P squared um, uh, multiplications. Now, you might say, well, I've already said P equals 23. Huh. You know, anyone can solve that. This is a real P, okay? That is a long, long, long number. I can't even read it out, it's so long. It's, it's ten, roughly 10 to the power 464. So the number of multiplications to solve 
that is 10 to the 900, something like that, which is, you know, that's more atoms in the universe sort of territory. It's absolutely horrific. So you, that's a very attractive sort of algorithm. It's got this uh, computational asymmetry. So that's all very encouraging because you are using the Diffie-Hellman Merkle key exchange right now. I mean, you used it to initiate uh, your discussion with uh, Crowdcast. If you're watching this on Crowdcast, you're using it with YouTube. If you're watching it on YouTube, you're probably simultaneously buying something on eBay. Everybody uses this. So it's good news that this is not easily crackable. Uh, well, uh, perhaps not use that P, though, because um, that one has been cracked, actually. Um, it's a bit too uh, simple, that one. Um, and it's rather interesting how it came about. Um, just to give you a sort of feel for this, um, one of the things that you do routinely in cryptography is you don't just sort of, you don't just sort of waffle about how much computation might be required. What people do is they look at the way you might crack this code. So you look at the, uh, the most efficient algorithm for solving this, which is a discrete log problem. And there's a number sieve um, algorithm which you could probably use. You look at what you think the complexity of that is. You then work out how long that would take to compute on a current computer. You then feed forward using something called Moore's law, which is an estimate of how computation will change in the future. Basically, computational power will double every 18 months. You then add a sort of safety band. And you say, well, this key then will be crackable at this point in the future. So you say, well, let's say I, was, I wanted this to uh, be safe up to, say, 2030. You turn to your Arjun Lenstra and Eric Verhul paper, which has all of these things listed, and you say, 2030, what do we require? Oh, yeah, we, need a key, we will need a key length of one and a half thousand digits, um, which is, in fact, um, what they recommend and is what people currently recommend. So it's not an idle, um, it's not a sort of casual uh, hand-wavy argument. It's a very specific argument. Now, of course, it doesn't take account of um, developments in numerical methods which might make that easier because you can't predict what people might know in the future. So if a new method for finding primes suddenly pops out of the, the system, then it is quite possible that you know, you've, you've got this wrong. Uh, 1,500 bits is a little bit long, actually. So um, if you're interested, and you, you can check this when you uh, look at the, uh, what your browser is doing, you'll usually find that people are now not using a circle as the confuser, if you like. That's the modular arithmetic. They're usually using a nice looking fancy curve, which looks a bit like this. It's called an elliptic curve. So if you've heard of this term elliptic uh, cryptography, it, it uses these curves like this. And what I was showing you previously was multiplication over the modulo. So we were raising five to the power. That's a multiplication. And actually what you do is a sort of addition over the elliptic curve. It's not the addition that we know. Addition looks a bit weird in elliptic geometry. It looks a bit like this. So you, if this is a point x, you draw a tangent through the curve and then you reflect it onto the next part of the curve. And that's how 2x is defined in elliptic geometry. Uh, you, to get 3x, you draw a line between x and 2x, um, like that. Then you bounce it across to the other side of the curve, and that gives you 3x, and so on, and so on. Now, exactly why this happens is another interesting lecture on elliptic geometry and elliptic curves. I very thoroughly recommend doing that. Uh, what I was keen to show was that you're getting that same sort of jumble effect that you get with the circle. It's very hard looking at these pink dots on the curve to work out what the heck the, the parameters were. Elliptic curve has two parameters. And because it's more complex, you can get away with shorter keys. And as I say here, it's become the sort of Swiss army knife of uh, cryptography, but it's just a, just a sort of fancier version of um, that. Now, Diffie-Hellman-Merkel is, so I did it, I call them a Merkel instead of a Merkel. Um, Diffie-Hellman-Merkel 
is a, a great um, system and probably has not been hacked too much at, at the moment, so we're safe using it. There are some people who can make some claims for it's being hacked, but mostly people think it's, it's, it's secure so long as you're using a safe key parameters and uh, there are various recommendations on how you should set those uh, key groups nowadays. Um, it, it, and it protects you provided you are talking to someone who's genuine. What it doesn't do, it doesn't protect you from what are called man-in-the-middle attacks. So in a man-in-the-middle attack is really quite easy to describe, and we did, I did talk about them in a previous lecture on networks where we were discussing the onion router, which is a, a method that's meant to be more robust to uh, man-in-the-middle attacks. The idea of it, a man-in-the-middle attack, is you think you're communicating with Barclays Bank, uh, but I'm in the middle of you, um, and when you're sending a message to Barclays, I'm going, oh, thank you very much, uh, I am Barclays, and to Barclays I'm saying, I am Keith, and I want my money, and I'm sort of keeping two conversations going at once, each one of you thinking that you're communicating with someone you're not, you're communicating with Eve, the evil person in the middle. So how does that get fixed? Well, there's a bit of cryptography that I haven't talked about, probably haven't got time to talk about, which is called certification authorities. So if you click on the um, padlock on your browser, if you're watching this online, then you will see details of how that certification works. So if, for example, if you were clicking on the uh, padlock on the Gresham College website, you would see a certificate signed by uh, Amazon. And Amazon would say, well, um, essentially Gresham College have paid us some money and bought a certificate uh, from us. And for that fee, we are prepared to assert that um, this is genuine. Now, precisely how that happens and is itself robust to the man in the middle attack is a little bit complicated to explain, but it uses a cunning and interesting bit of technology called a hash. And a hash is a, a numerical way of checking whether something is correct. And because they're interesting, I'll come back to them in a moment. Right, so that's enough uh, crypto for, for a bit, otherwise all our brains will explode. So you, you can see the idea. The idea is to make this sort of confuser of which the elliptic curve is a good um, example. Now then, hacking. Well, uh, we, could, we could have a huge, great uh, discussion about the history of hacking. I just wanted to pick out some sort of eras in hacking, which I think are interesting in terms of um, what I'm trying to say in terms of this lecture. When we look very early on uh, in hacking, of course, there wasn't an internet. So the early attempts at, I was going to say deception, but I don't even think that is correct. There's sort of real intellectual curiosity about how things worked was driving the early attempts at hacking. And probably the earliest of that was something called phone freaking. Um, I don't know if you remember phone freaking, but the, the idea was it soon became quite apparent that um, a number of telcos were using um, tones, secret tones you could send down the um, wire to control the exchange. So this was great because um, you could send the right combinations of tones down an AT&T uh, wire in the US and get free phone calls. So this was great. You could buy a box called a frame freaking box and beep, 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 and suddenly you got free phone calls. Well, marvellous. And of course, of course, it was ripping off at and t but one, it was sort of ripping off the man, you know, so that was good, and it was generally it was sort of Robin Hood sort of crime and barely seen as crime. And it probably arose out of sort of intellectual curiosity about how things worked, and I think a genuine worry that companies weren't taking security seriously. And that's probably also true of the, the first big financial hack, really, which was the Chaos Computer Club um, hack in 1984. Um, they, um, the Chaos Computer Club discovered a flaw in a Hamburg uh, bank, and they removed um, 134,000 Deutschmarks um, from it. Uh, what the reason they did this was because prior to the incident, they had notified the bank that there was a, a flaw, and the bank had either ignored them or, or just said, no, there isn't. So uh, to prove that there was, they removed 134,000 Deutschmarks, and 
and the press conference the following day, they gave it back. You know, and it was a sort of um, a very sort of public, uh, almost a sort of public spirited attempt to show that there was some computer security problems. And the same sort of idea was probably behind the first computer worm, known as the, the Morris worm after, um, oh, uh, Robert Morris, wasn't it? Yes, Robert Morris was a grad student, I think, at Harvard. And um, he released this hack, um, which relied in part upon something which is still with us, which is the dreaded buffer overflow hack. Um, again, a bit of software engineering uh, error, somebody had designed a buffer which wasn't able to deal with overflows properly so when you overflowed it, the computer was left in a state that made it vulnerable and this worm spread fairly vigorously around the internet uh, Morris was arrested I think he was the first felony conviction in the USA actually under the, uh, under the 1986 Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and um, he was uh, given a suspended sentence but it was really a uh, a bit of intellectual curiosity that he did this. You know, he was, he was curious to know if he could make this thing spread, and by God, it did. It took a lot of time to, to unspread it. And uh, he paid the price. Well, well, perhaps not so much of a price, because he's now a professor at MIT, actually, which was the organisation he attempted to smear from... Uh, uh, well, he, he, released the, the, he released the Morris Worm from MIT, even though he wasn't at MIT, in an attempt to sort of throw off the feds to persuade them to go somewhere else. In the 1990s, everything changed. Uh, we moved from this intellectual curiosity being the dominant force, it's still there in a lot of um, hacking attempts, to commerce. And as soon as we had commerce, we got cash on the table. And you know, that really led to this whole new form of hacking, which is very prevalent at the moment, you know, which is theft and or extortion. Uh, they're not really doing it for any public-spirited reasons. They're not even doing it to be a menace. They're doing it to make money. Um, very simple uh, bit of crime, really. And then this last um, theme, which has popped up recently with the Snowden leaks, and that's really cyber warfare. You know, it's using the internet for state, um, state purposes that amount to warfare. And uh, there was a very interesting lecture by Tara Wheeler talking about how, on the flip side um, of warfare, we also have war crimes. You know, and clearly some of the um, well, I found her argument persuasive that clearly some of these hacks are tantamount, if not perhaps more than tantamount, to war crimes because they're causing uh, mass hurt to, in, in, they're causing mass hurt and it's being done so indiscriminately, uh, which is one of the features of a war crime, I believe. Right, okay, well that was just a brief relief, so I'll quickly get back to hash functions. Now, hash functions, what are they? Um, so, one of the things that comes up a lot in computing is a worry that you need to check that the data you've transmitted is correct. And you can see the problem. Um, you know, I think the other day I was doing a backup and it was, what was it, a couple of terabytes. Well, how do I know that a couple of terabytes was transferred from my little computer in, in, in the middle of Suffolk to some server, Lord knows where, in, somewhere in Europe? And it was transmitted without errors, because certainly there's a lot of errors about, and there's no reason to think that things shouldn't have error. Well, actually, that's a relatively easy um, problem, and we'll use a check number, and that check number travels with the data. Um, so the obvious one is to say, well, why don't we just, we'll take a block of data, and if it's got an even number of ones in it, I'll add a one to make it an odd number of ones. And that's called odd parity. Like I say, if it's got an odd number of ones, I'll add one. And so you can see that gives you some protection because if one of those ones gets changed, then probably the ones don't match anymore because if I've converted an even number to an odd number, the parity doesn't match. Oh, something's happened. Now, it only gives me protection of one error and parity is, you know, that's one of the problems with parity. Parity is cheap. Um, but it doesn't give you much protection. And parity is used um, 
at a very low level in the internet already. Well, could we do something fancier? Yeah, let's add up the number of ones and let's write that to a field. And pretty much every packet in the internet will have a checksum added to it, which essentially counts the number of ones in the packet. So if a packet's corrupted, the checksum doesn't add up. Or if a checksum's corrupted, it doesn't add up. So we re-add it. Adding's quick, so we just go, oh, there's meant to be 17 ones in this packet. This says 16. Error. Resend the packet. It's a very simple idea. Or perhaps we could generate a sort of string of digits that's a sort of digital fingerprint for the data. Now, there's lots of ways you could do that. Um, but the, the basic idea is to put the data through some incredibly sort of complex mixer, a sort of munging, digital, great big digital munging, that produces a number that is unique to the data. And that's what we call a hash function. It's called a hash from a cooking analogy. So if you have a, a breakfast hash or something, it's a mixture of you know, eggs and bacon and all sorts of lovely things that aren't very good for you. And like a hash, um, you know the ingredients, but you jolly well can't separate them once they've been cooked together. So that's the idea behind a hash function. Now, cryptographic hashes have been around for ages. Uh, cryptographic hashes have some special uh, properties. So they have the basic property, which is they are going to convert a file or a block of data into a set of numbers. Uh, this is actually one of the simple cryptographic hashes out there. And don't worry about the numbers. They're written in hexadecimal, but I could have written them in binary or, or decimal or something. It's just a, just a number. The first requirement of a cryptographic hash is it's impossible or very difficult to get back the original data from the hash. So you can't easily look at the hash and work out what was sent. So this can be very useful for checking something is correct without actually knowing what the something is. You can imagine um, how might this be useful. Let's say we had a photograph of me and you wanted to check that um, it really was me, but you didn't actually want to send the photograph. So what you would do, you'd just check the hash. You'd say, well, the hash matches, so probably it is that image of Richard that I'm uh, familiar of. You don't have to send the original. Very useful in cryptography. The other requirement of a cryptographic hash is that there are no collisions. So a collision is when two bits of data have the same hash. So we don't want that to happen. Um, and collision attacks come up a lot in crypto, actually. Um, uh, I can't remember. Maybe we talk about them a little bit later. Um, so crypto hash shouldn't have uh, this property. We shouldn't be able to generate a hash from two separate bits of data. That said, um, one of the well-known hashes, the uh, secure hash algorithm, uh, one of the first secure hash algorithms was, in fact, broken with a collision um, in 2017. And here is the, uh, the paper that discussed this was called, Sh because it was called SHA, the uh, cryptic sh secure hash algorithm. This, is, this paper is called Shattered, shattered. Uh, and these are the two files that generate um, this hash. Um, that is actually the hash of those two files. And you can see that they are uh, fundamentally different. They're both PDF files, uh, but they generate the same data. So uh, these hashes are tending to get longer and longer and longer. And um, I think the sort of current state of the art is where the sort of smallest hash that one dare gets away with is SHA-256, so that's 256 uh, length. Hasn't been broken yet. This is an example of SHA-256. There's my block of data, which I've transferred into this great big long um, thing. It's longer, it's commonly used, and uh, most hashes you would wish to be speedy because you want to be able to quickly check, quickly verify that this thing is... Uh, what was sent or, or some, uh, some sort of baseline. Now, the reason I mentioned SHA-256 is because um, it's commonly used in um, cryptocurrency. I mean, this is a well-known cryptocurrency. This is um, Bitcoin. Um, and the idea here behind uh, cryptocurrency is that we have a secret key. Um, that's an example of a secret key here. We put it through some elliptic curve 
crypto system and that generates a public key. So just thinking back to Alice and Bob and Diffie, Helm and Merkel, they're not using that algorithm, they're using something much more complicated. And that, the trouble is that public key is absolutely jolly enormous. That's this thing here. So what the hash function does is it fixes it into a fixed size and smaller number that isn't the public key, but it's something that we can uh, work with. So it uses this crypto hash to get an address. And once you've got the address, you can generate, uh, you, can, you can transact with, uh, in this case, uh, crypto coin, uh, this case Bitcoin, which is one of these public leisure systems. Okay, so far, so good, you know, and that seems fairly secure. However, the problem, and this is a problem with a lot of secure systems, is that the, you can't possibly remember these keys. I mean, they're completely impossible. So what a lot of people do is they use a wallet system. And this is the algorithm for a particularly insecure uh, wallet system called Brain Wallet. And what you do is you have some plain text uh, system like this. You whack it through, say, SHA-256, which is a nice secure hash algorithm. You generate a secret key and off you go. Um, I could tell you the problem with this, but I, there's a brilliant um, lecture on this on YouTube, and I'll just get, I'm going to play you quite a long clip of it because I think it sort of brilliantly expounds all of the things I've been talking about in a, in a really compressed uh, way. Now, these guys talk pretty quickly, so um, do, um, do, do listen carefully. For this, something that is very useful to know about is brain wallets. Now, the idea of brain wallets is to be able to control some money, some Bitcoin, with just something that you can keep in your head. And this may seem like a good idea because nobody can read your mind, right? But as we learned, a fast computer can probably get, take a very good guess at anything that you are able to remember yourself. So how brain wallets work is that they just add another uh, step in the derivation process we've seen before. So to generate the private key, they just take some memorable string, like correct horse battery staple, or whatever you're using, and hash it to get a private key that then it's used to generate the public key, to generate the address, which then used to receive money. And then by just remembering that string, you can move that money and use it to pay for something else. Sure, the, the idea of using passwords for, uh, to save money is already kind of unsettling, but since we've learned so much about password storage and how to make sure that database dumps are not cracked, you'd think, well, obviously they used something slow, something like bcrypt or scrypt that is hard to brute force, right? You'd be wrong. They use SHA-256. A perfectly cromulent hash algorithm. <laughs> uh, so for my DEF CON talk, I did a bunch of research into cracking brain wallets, and I went through the transaction history of a lot of them that I was able to find. Uh, correct horse battery staple was, in fact, used. It's had about 15 bitcoins go through it, give or take. Um, and over 4,000 transactions. Um, there's a complicated reason for that if you want to know why, find me later. Uh, then Bitcoin is awesome. Had 500 Bitcoin put into it at once and, uh, and then somebody else found it. And whoever put it there originally was sad. My favorite though is the empty string. Nobody would ever guess that one. Uh, that has had almost 60 Bitcoin go through it, and 50 of it was all at once. Um, somebody had a really bad day, because it was stolen instantly. Um, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, has had about 100 Bitcoin go through it. So, yeah, people do some things. Um, so. Of course, I'm not the only one who's had this idea. There are plenty of other people who have gone through with quite extensive dictionaries and guest brain wallets. Um, this fellow was active on Reddit and the Bitcoin forums for a while. He would um, crack the addresses, sweep them off for uh, safekeeping. I 
have no idea how much he actually kept, but anytime somebody would complain about getting their brain wallet ripped off, um, if, he, if he had the key, he'd show up and uh, offer to return it. Um, some people were not so nice. Um, this other fellow came on Reddit to complain because that's what people do on Reddit. Um, he lost four bitcoins out of his brain wallet, and the passphrase was a line from an obscure poem in Afrikaans. So somebody had some pretty serious dictionaries they were throwing at this, um, which is really interesting. Um, and if you're curious what sort of performance can be done with this, BrainFlare itself in the latest version um, the biggest job I've run in it was checking all six character ASCII passwords. That ended up being a search space of a little less than 750 billion. Um, I did that in less than 24 hours for $50 on Amazon's cloud computing service. Um, so. So, to hammer in the point of uh, how dangerous it is to essentially take a password dump that is com already public because it's in the blockchain and putting money on it after not even using S script, we're gonna lose some money on stage. So what we're gonna run here is um, a simple script that now will generate a brain wallet with a short enough keys. That's the, the brain wallet password. And it will send some money to it. And if the demo gods are with us, Okay, so this is the blockchain.info page, and this is, um, this is our transaction that just deposited some money in this very vulnerable uh, brain wallet. It's uh, currently spreading through the network, and um, with a little luck, somebody will be watching. <laughs> Obviously, nobody can... Oh, compute. there we go. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sure this guy loves us. He's been stealing our test wallets all day. <laughs> Okay. So, I mean, it's humorous and also alarming, I think. Now, to be fair, that's an attack not on the security of Bitcoin. It's an attack on the security of a sort of infrastructure associated with Bitcoin. And this is a very common theme in security failings. Uh, the cryptographers design quite a secure system, and it's the way people use it that cause it to be insecure. Um, by the way, um, 500 Bitcoin, I did write this down. Yeah, that's 13 and a half million pounds sterling. So that's quite a lot of money to lose in a few minutes, I think, um, assuming that it was indeed theft. It certainly, the guys seem to think it was theft. Uh, now, all of these crypto systems use a public ledger, and the public ledger is complicated and has a lot of hashing and built-in uh, checking in it, and I haven't got time to talk about how that works, but the issue is, this is a sort of what's called a, a birthday problem attack. So a birthday problem derives from an analogy. The teacher says to the class, let's say there are 30 people in the class, he says, well, what's the chance that one of you has got the same birthday as me? Well, that's improbable, you know, because there's 365 days in a year, so you can work it out quite easily. But if you ask how many people do we have, in, have to have in the class such that, they, that, any, anyone in the, that, that, that there are such that there are two people in the class who have the same birthday, that's incredibly, that's much, much more likely. So if we have a public ledger, we can sit there watching the public ledger and we can be trying possible password combinations to see what they might be. We'll make a great big list and as soon as we see one of them pop up, We've generated the private key for that, and suddenly we've got access to it. I'm not even sure it's theft, actually. Um, if you've got a private key, well, you probably... Do you own the money? I mean, it seems a bit dubious to me. Uh, now, lots of blockchain uh, systems have failed because of this, and there's a fascinating website, which I'm just scrolling through here, which is a list of... It's called the Blockchain Graveyard. You can go and look at it if you like. And it sort of goes through quite a few of these security failings. So that is one of the main significant changes over in the security space, which is that the rewards are now very substantial indeed. 
13 and a half million, and all you had to do was spend maybe a couple of thousand dollars on an Amazon cloud surface to compute, then you just sort of sit there waiting to win the lottery. It's, it's an attractive thought, isn't it? It is if you're a criminal, anyway. The second factor are state actors. And um, the Snowden leaks really talk about these. Um, now, should we believe the Snowden leaks? I've got no idea. I mean, I have no inside information on it. And what I do know is that the US government certainly acted like they were very serious indeed, which implies that there are at least some type of truth in them. And as far as I can see, they really talk about three sorts of activity. The first one we've heard about already, which is just code breaking. You know, that's, that's old hat, to use the, the hats of earlier. That's not really interesting. The two new things that he talks about, which I think are interesting and changing the security landscape, the first one is industrial espionage, where state actors either collaborate with or, do, or, or, or attack people who are part of the supply chain, if you like, to create vulnerabilities, and this, which they will use later when they need to. They don't use them immediately, but they create those vulnerabilities. So that's one interesting um, maneuver. And the third one is good old-fashioned hacking, but sort of collecting vulnerabilities. And uh, this sort of collect, looking for and collecting vulnerabilities is quite new and has led to a new idea called the vulnerabilities equities process. So it's not a new idea in espionage. So the idea in espionage has been around for a, a long time, which is um, there are some secrets which are too valuable, which we have gathered via intelligence, which are too valuable to reveal. So imagine you had some, you discovered some backdoor to Microsoft Windows, for example. You might think that would be terribly useful if war broke out and you needed to use it. So we'll keep it to ourselves. The trouble with keeping it to yourself, of course, is that your own systems are also using Microsoft Windows, so you've got a vulnerability in your own systems which could be used by the enemy who might get to it before you. So in order to cope with that, you have to have an equities process which essentially balances the benefit of keeping it secret against the disbenefit of uh, keeping it secret. And both the US and UK governments, and I assume other Western governments, have such a process. This is the block diagram which you can find on GCHQ's website that goes through their vulnerabilities uh, website, but there's a similar one available in the US. It's been around for a long time, but it only got publicised by accident when um, there was a US Freedom of Information request um, made about this, and it sort of came out that there was this process. This is very current. Um, this was last week's news when I was writing this lecture. Um, we have uh, the Colonial Pipeline in the US was shut down for quite a while. Colonial Pipeline uh, delivers oil from Texas to New York and was causing people to panic and have queues at the pumps. Um, this website claimed they paid a ransom of $90 million, in, $90 million in Bitcoin. They've since come out and said they actually paid $4.4 million US. I think that sounds a bit cheap to me, I mean, given the disruption they were causing. It's a flipping nuisance when people pay ransoms, of course, because it encourages people to build software that shuts, shuts you down. Um, SolarWinds, one of the first supply line attacks. SolarWinds is a company that makes bits and bobs that help you manage networks. Um, they left part of their system um, open. Uh, hackers got into the system. They issued software updates of SolarWinds softwares with correct certificates, thinking back to the certificate idea, so that people didn't realize they had been attacked. Uh, so unraveling that all has been very, very uh, painful. And here's the head of the Russian intelligence chief claiming that the um, SolarWinds hack was indeed the idea of the UK and the US. Seems a bit far-fetched, doesn't it? I don't know why we would attack our own companies like this and our own organisations. I, mean, I think that's highly incredible. And um, the Irish health system is currently, this we're talking in May uh, uh, 2021, is currently under attack from uh, ransomware. It's all money. Yeah, it's all driven by money. Meanwhile, uh, law enforcement agencies are keen on making statements like this. And uh, this is uh, the UK Home Secretary, that's the Interior Minister of the UK, and what she's talking here is about the prospect of Facebook using end-to-end -end encryption on its messenger service. 
she says it's not a good idea because uh, criminals will be able to talk to each other or criminals will be able to interfere with children uh, and not be uh, stopped by law enforcement agencies. That's what she said on the 19th of April in 2021. Um, a month later, she said, um, the solar winds attack is very serious and we need to protect ourselves. Well, the internet is open. So in order to protect yourself, you need encryption. It's, there's no way out of it. You know? And so, well, there is. Let's have a new internet, uh, a different, pro, different connect, connectivity. But while we're having the internet, we have to have encryption to protect ourselves. These arguments are ridiculous, in my view. You know, it's a bit like uh, the police telling me that I shouldn't have a lock on my door because criminals could use locks and it would make it difficult to get in. You know, we, we, it's exactly the same argument. So I've drawn out two themes in security which I think are going to be important for us. One is the state actor, which I've talked about briefly, and the other is money. I think these are some questions that are sort of running around. Um, if you want something, and it's always easy to get sort of doom and despondency, but if you want to feel a bit more positive, let me quickly play you a clip about this uh, Brazilian lad who, um, well, the, the clip is short and self-evident. Hi, I'm Santiago, and I'm a hacker. Are you going to make it happen today? Or will you just settle for another delay? Come on, you got to make it happen now. Come on, you got to make it happen now. Sit. Are you going to wait and sit on your hands? Or will you go and start making out a list of demands? Because you can make it happen, so choose a bitch of passion. Bugs are security flaws in code. Santi finds them. Bounties are the rewards he gets for discovering them. Ooh, Santi's the first hacker to make a million dollars on the world's biggest bug bounty platform, Hacker One. Did you find your bank account was sort of filling up and you needed <laughs> yeah. to spend it? So good for Santi and uh, good for Hacker One, who are an entity that um, paid him all that money. And I ought to thank Hacker One because uh, Laurie Mercer, who works for Hacker One, helped me considerably in. Uh, finding some of these examples and clips in this lecture. And that brings this lecture to an end, and indeed, this season to an end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Harvey. We've got a couple of uh, audience questions. Now, we are right. out of time, but um, maybe I can just give you a few. Um, the first one I have here is, how should I choose a good password? Yeah, go on to the National Cyber Security Centre. It tells you exactly what to do. Great. That's an easy one. <laughs> Lovely. Um, are there really quantum computer-proof cryptography methods? Oh, yeah, that's a brilliant question. Um, and it's so controversial what co quantum computing can and cannot do. I've steered away from it. I fear it needs a whole new lecture in its, in its own right. To be honest, I was hoping to wait for a year before talking about quantum because some of the theories will be a little bit clearer uh, then. So, in short there is considerable worry amongst some people that quantum computing will be so powerful that none of these methods will work. If so, the goodies will use quantum computing, quantum computing as well. So I don't think it is going to make a significant difference because any technology that's available to the baddies is also available to the goodies. Okay, great. And how do we assess a chain of trust? Oh, that's a good question. Um, com computation isn't very good at trust at the moment, and there's probably a need for quite a lot of work in a trust algebra, I think. We have very complex networks of trust as humans, and we haven't really captured that properly yet in the computing world. Our notion of trust, which is certification authorities and uh, authentications of those, is quite primitive to comparing to the way that we build trust, and I would love to see some work on that. Um, we talked about encryption. Do any of the current encryption methods have a defense against the sheer brute force computing power that quantum computing has? Yeah, um, well, yeah, that's a kind of a sort of repeat of the earlier question, isn't it? In the sense that um, there is a worry that quantum computing might have enormous power. Just to be reassure you, at the moment it does not. Right? It doesn't have the power. There are theoretical papers saying it could be powerful when applied to decryption, but it, 
would be equally powerful, I think, when implied to encryption. So there's no reason to automatically assume that the world, it is a catastrophe when quantum computing is, uh, becomes a reality. What will happen is both the goodies and the baddies will have to adopt the technology, and there'll be the usual sort of tussle between them to see who's, who gets there first. And a final question from the audience. How do you rate the store now, crack later programs that the US allegedly runs? I don't know anything about them, but the, um, you could see there was something of that in, the, uh, in that example, wasn't it? The idea that you, you generate this vast, vast, vast list of private keys. Um, and when the balloon goes up, as it were, you sort of open your uh, black box and say, oh, yes. This is what we know. The vulnerabilities equities process is meant to cover that. Um, the, the, the issue to bear in mind is that a vulnerability that is indiscriminate and could affect all of us, it points back at you as well as it, it might help you uh, deal with the enemy, but it also exposes you. So that's, that's the point. There are very few vulnerabilities now which are, uh, you know, if you Vulnerabilities in generic IT systems like Microsoft and Apple and so on, they're there for all of us, the baddies and the goodies. Thank you again, Professor Harvey, and thank you all for coming. We hope you enjoyed the lecture, and we'll be sending you a link to the video and transcript in a couple of days' time. If you sign up to our mailing list on the website now, we can tell you about Professor Harvey's next lectures starting this autumn on six tech inventions that changed the world.